Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to our Fairfax Cryobank webinar, Home Insemination with Donor Sperm. As you can see, this webinar recording, it will be shared out with everyone who's on today's call afterwards later this afternoon via email. So check your email if you're not able to join the full session. So today we are joined uh, by Kate Wisda, as you can see here. Kate is our uh, women's health nurse practitioner for PRS, Pacific Reproductive Services. And she'll be joining us to cover the home insemination information. And then we have myself, the marketing manager for Fairfax Cryobank, and I will be covering the donor sperm basics and also be moderating our Q&A at the end. So like I mentioned, um, if you have questions, go ahead and submit them throughout the webinar today and we will go through and we'll check those at the end of the session. So let's go ahead and get started here. Here are some of the goals for today's webinar. So the first goal is the overview of donor sperm. We're also going to do a review of home intracervical inseminations, ICIs, and then we will go through questions at the end. So just to give you a little bit of background on Fairfax Cryobank, just to tell you a little bit about us. So Fairfax Cryobank has been around as a trusted torch for donor sperm since 1986. And we are accompanied by two other sperm banks that we acquired, Pacific Reproductive Services, PRS, and Cryogenic Laboratories, CLI. And you'll find donors from all three brands in the donor search, which we'll review here in a second. So there's a lot that goes into the donor selection process. It can be kind of overwhelming. There's a lot of information that we provide on the donor profiles. Um, and there's a lot of information that you have to sift through and decide, you know, what is the best match for you. And so we really just, you know, recommend that you create a list of traits that are important to you. What are the crucial things that you need to be looking at, such as physical characteristics, uh, blonde hair, um, blue eyes, someone who looks like someone in your family or a friend, their educational background. We do have a variety of donors um, who have graduate degrees, so that's important to you. Their ethnic origin, um, where are they from, and then the donor type. We have two types of donors, ID and non-ID. There's a lot that goes into the selection process, so it's fun to play around on the donor search. So go ahead, check out the donor search if you have not, and then see you know, when you enter these sort of queries, what kind of matches you come up with. One way that's um, very helpful to go through all of these donor profiles, like I mentioned, we have so much information about all of these different donors, and some of it is only available um, you know, by purchase. But one way to do that is through an unlimited access plan or a ULA. These ULAs, they get you access to all of these different donor products, such as audio interviews, personality types, adult and photo child sets, and lifetime photos if they are available. Um, and so we do recommend that you sign up for basic, full, or even club Fairfax, depending on um, you know, what your plan looks like for buying sperm through Fairfax Cryobank. So today we're going to go through um, just you know some talk about all of these different types of vials really quick. So um, just to kind of define some of these terminology that you'll hear today as Kate gets through her presentation, and um, you know this kind of helps you decide what type of sperm vial type you need to be purchasing as well. So we do have art vials, which are artificial reproductive technology. IUI, which is intrauterine insemination, and then ICI vials which are intracervical insemination for our home insemination. And then home insemination, one can perform an ICI in the comfort of their own home to attempt a, uh, to achieve a pregnancy. So we know this is kind of a lot of information. I do recommend you check out our vial preparation information on our website because we have a great infographic that's kind of, you can see little snippets of it here. It lets you kind of decide, depending on what procedure you're going to have, such as IVF or IUI, what type of vial you need to purchase. So it helps kind of guide you and it, and it helps you understand the different types that work for your procedure. 
So once you're ready, you've gone through the donor search and you know what type of vial type you want to purchase, you know, in terms of next steps, really you're going to go ahead, you're going to need some basic information to call client services. And so you'll need the donor number, the preparation type, which is that, that vial type that we just saw, the number of vials, uh, and the shipping information. And then you can go ahead. Uh, you also need to consider, are you going to be wanting to use this donor uh, later on down the road? And if so, you should probably consider put purchasing extra vials more than you just need for this one attempt. Um, and in that case, we do have storage available where you can store with us. Um, and then we also have something called a vial buyback program where we will purchase it back if it's unused and it's been at our facility the whole time. And that is also on the website as well. If you go to the resources tab under donor uh, sperm, there's a vial buyback section which gives you more details on that process. Client services, we have a great team of uh, client services staff who can help you with the order once you're ready to place uh, the order and everything. So you will contact them at info at fairfaxcryobank.com uh, and they are happy to help you answer any questions as well. So here's a little sneak peek of what you can expect for home delivery. Here's what our uh, boxes look like. Uh, you will be receiving a box with a shipping tank that contains your sperm samples, paperwork, and a needleless syringe. Um, and then you can see here, we do require the home delivery authorization paperwork to be all settled before you uh, order. So you do want to contact client services to get that squared away before you're able to set up home delivery. Uh, and if you do have additional questions about what it's like to get that box and what, what are the next steps with everything, we do have a great resource video on our YouTube channel. It's the Fairfax Cryobank YouTube. Um, and so it's a home insemination with donors from unboxing and we go through everything, um, you know, from the box, opening the box to what to do with it, um, all the timing and stuff. is It's all laid out in that uh, YouTube video for you. All right, so let's go ahead and switch gears here over to Kate. Hi everyone, my name is Kate. I am a women's health nurse practitioner and I practice in Pasadena, California. I work for Fairfax Cryobank and I'm here to talk to you about at-home inseminations, which we also call ICI or intracervical inseminations. Um, next slide. Is home insemination right for you? Yes, if you are free of fertility issues. For uh, patients who are wondering if they should check on their fertility and see if they have any issues, uh, typically we recommend patients who are over 35, uh, patients with irregular cycles, check with your doctor, your OBGYN, and see if you need to do any testing for that. Comfortable with the idea of performing the procedure in your home, I would say you need to either have a bed or a sofa, that's all you really need. Uh, and we will provide the syringe and everything else. Uh, discussed family building with a medical provider. We're gonna talk about that in the next slide. Uh, acceptable under the laws of your state. So uh, each state differs depending on uh, whether or not you can buy, sell, use frozen sperm. So client services will be able to help you figure that out. Uh, the number is listed for client services below. Next slide. Do I need to work with a medical provider? So I'm here to beg you to please talk to your doctor before you decide to get pregnant. Whether you're 22, 32, or 42, and you don't know if you have any fertility issues or you feel healthy, just meet with your doctor, do some basic testing, uh, let them know when you call that you're, you're coming in for a physical because you would like to get pregnant in the future. Uh, sometimes we call that a preconception visit. You can go to either your primary care provider or you can go to your OBGYN, however it works for your insurance, however it works, um, maybe you have a better relationship with your OBGYN than your primary care, that's fine. Just go to a doctor, let them know that you'd like to get pregnant and they will do some blood draws for you 
They'll check your fertility if you have irregular cycles or if you're over the age of 35. Um, they will also do some basic labs like HIV, Hep C, Hep B, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia. Uh, they may check your immunity to varicella, rubella. There's a bunch of stuff that they can do along with listening to your heart and lungs. Uh, if you have a pre-existing condition such as uh, a thyroid issue, hypertension, high blood pressure, or diabetes, uh, they will want you to be stable medically stable before you try to get pregnant. That will help reduce risk of uh, complications with your pregnancy, any um, negative consequences to you or the baby. So meeting with your doctor is very, very important. You're gonna say, doc, I'm ready to get pregnant. Let me know, am I physically stable? Um, is this a good idea for me at this time, medically speaking? And um, they'll help you come up with a game plan. Okay, next slide. Why try home insemination? So yeah, so oftentimes couples are told to try at home for several months when they wanna start a family. Home insemination allows individuals and couples without a sperm providing partner to try at home before moving to in-office procedures. So doing an insemination at home is often considered a first step. It's less clinical, it's often more comfortable, and it can be more meaningful for individuals and couples. Uh, you can control your environment, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, a couple slides down about how you can set up a nice environment for yourself. Next slide. Getting started. Okay, so this is the hardest part, and I made a bunch of slides for you guys so you can get through the hardest part, which is figuring out when you're fertile. Can you figure out when you're fertile? Absolutely. I just have a million tips for you <laughs> and hopefully it'll make sense and you can have a better understanding of your body and when you should inseminate. So we wanna find out when you're fertile and then you will inseminate on that day. So let's go through this. Getting started, time to track. So you're gonna track your menstrual cycle with a smartphone app. Uh, it doesn't matter what app you use. I would recommend just going to the app store on your phone, Finding one that's very popular, that's free. You don't have to pay for it. If you wanna pay for it and that is something that you like, then go for it. But you're going to get a menstrual app and you're going to start tracking your cycle. So the most important thing to know is that each cycle begins with the first day of your period. We call that cycle day one. So the first day of your period when you're using a pad or a tampon, when you're having actual blood flow that requires a pad or a tampon, that's your cycle day one. Okay, uh, cycles last on average 28 to 30 days. Most people are 28 to 30 days, but plenty of people can have cycles that are 21 to 24 days, 33 to 35 days. Uh, you're more than welcome to have a variation too. You can be off by a couple days. Uh, as long as it's within 21 to 35 days, that's considered normal. So if your cycles one month are 20 days, and then the next month you have a cycle that lasts 40 days, that's considered irregular. So you wanna to talk to your doctor about that and say, doc, I sometimes miss a month or two before I get my period. Will that affect my fertility? That may be related to something like polycystic ovarian syndrome, and it may be a little harder for you to get pregnant. Not impossible, not by any means impossible, but we might, might wanna make some extra efforts, okay? Uh, so again, cycles last average 28 to 30 days, normal, is still 21 to 35 days. If you're off by a couple days, there's a couple day variation, that's fine. If you're missing months at a time, that's irregular. Uh, determine ovulation. So what we use is called an ovulation predictor kit. You guys probably, are, probably already know this by now. You probably have some in your home. We're gonna talk about OPKs, we call them, uh, and which ones are the best. So they're commercially available at any drugstore. Some of our patients like to go online and get them. Uh, it doesn't matter what drugstore you go to. You want to get an OPK that detects your LH surge. All the OPKs detect LH surge. LH, it stands for luteinizing hormone. It's a hormone in your body that surges. If you look at this graph, it surges. That blue line is the LH level, the luteinizing hormone. It surges 12 to 24 hours before your ovulation. It gives you this, this alarm that goes off that tells you in 24 hours you're going to be fertile. In 24 hours you're going to be fertile. 
it's fantastic. So we, the textbook technically says 12 to 24 hours. I follow the 24 hour rule. That's more likely. Uh, <clears throat> so your ovulation will occur 24 hours after your LH surge. <clears throat> and ovulation that occurs 12 to 24 hours after your LH surge is your true fertile period. And the ovulation only lasts about 12 to 24 hours. To keep things simple, most people operate on a 24 hour. So you're probably fertile for about 24 hours and that occurs 24 hours after your LH surge. So your LH surge is what will cause your OPK to look positive. So you know once you get your positive, you're not, you're not ovulating. You've got 24 hours before you ovulate. Uh, which OPK? So this is an example of a digital test it's got a smiley face. We do not want you to get the digital test. The digital tests are uh, a little faulty for our purposes. We also don't want you to get the ones that say that they're the most sensitive, uh, AKA the most expensive ones. So you're not gonna be testing every six hours. You're not gonna be testing in the evening. We want you just to test in the morning. And these very, very sensitive tests, they're gonna show you the slow increase to LH. What you wanna know is that search. You want to know when that blue line goes bonkers, it goes off the graph, when you're having your search. That's when you know you've got 24 hours you're going to inseminate. Um, so get the test with the two lines. Do not get digital. Don't get a happy face. Uh, and we'll show you two slides down. There's actually a picture that'll show you what the OPK with the two lines looks like. They're usually the cheaper ones. It'll be like the drugstore brand. Um, and it'll come with seven strips, $25, something like that. But you don't want to spend $150 on a super fancy OPK because it's it's just going to confuse you. It's going to tell you that your LH is slowly increasing, but that's we don't need to know that. We just want to know that surge. We just want to know when it goes bonkers. Okay, next slide. So getting started, how to test. Test your second urine of the day. So you're going to test in the morning and you're not gonna use that first urine. The first urine is too concentrated. It's been sitting there since 10 p.m. since you went to sleep. So what we suggest you do is wake up two and a half to three hours before your normal alarm, urinate, and then stumble back to sleep. Wake up again with your normal alarm and test your second urine of the day. This is the easiest way for most people, but you don't have to do it this way as long as you get your second urine. So the example we have down below is wake up at 6 a.m. If you normally wake up at 8.30 a.m., you're going to wake up at 6, you're going to pee, flush that pee, go back to bed, wake up with your alarm at 8.30 a.m., and you're going to test that urine. Okay, so the second urine of the day. Uh, it's also important to know that uh, it's kind of a 50-50 difference between uh, whether or not you're going to get a quick rise to LH or a slow rise to LH. So you can have where you test three days and you get no line, no line, no line, and the fourth day there's a really, really dark line that says you're positive. Uh, the other 50% of people can have a slow rise. So you'll have a light line on the first day that you test and then a slightly darker line and then even a little darker line and then on the fourth day you get this really, really, really dark line. Um, so it depends on the person. Um, if you're a quick rise, you'll kind of always be a quick rise. If you're a slow riser, you'll always be a slow riser. So uh, this is why we recommend that you start testing two or three months before you decide to inseminate, before you get that sperm in your home, um, so that you can figure out if you're a quick riser, a slow riser, um, and then you can figure out the whole getting up two and a half hours before your normal alarm and seeing what works for you. Next slide. Negative OPK. So this is the test with the two lines. It looks like a litmus test. Uh, it doesn't have a digital happy face. It doesn't have a digital P for positive, nothing like that. It's really, really simple test. So uh, a, this is an example of a negative OPK. Both of these are negative. So only the control line shows up. That's the top example. Or you have the control line, which is darker than the test line. So the control line, you pee, that's going to show up right away. It'll be nice and dark. It'll be that nice dark red. Um, that's a negative. If you get the second one, you pee, the control line shows up nice and dark, but the test line is just barely there. That's still a negative, it's not a positive. That shows you that your LH rise is nice and slow, it's occurring. It's really nice because it gives you warning in a couple of days you're gonna have a positive, uh, or maybe even one day you'll have a positive. 
but it's not positive, it's negative. Okay, next slide. Positive OPK. So again, what's gonna happen is that you're gonna pee, you're gonna see that control line, nice dark red, and then a positive line, it's gonna be exactly like the control line. So if you look at this first example, you've got two really pretty dark red lines, that's a positive. Uh, what we ideally wanna see from an OPK, and this doesn't always happen, but this ideally we'd wanna see that nice red control line, and we wanna see a really thick, really burgundy test line. That tells us that you're having surge. The test line is you. That's when you um, are at your maximum LH. So the luteinizing hormone spikes. Uh, that's when it goes bonkers off the graph. So both of these are examples of positive OPKs. You know that in 24 hours, you're going to inseminate. So this is your 24 hour warning. Okay, next slide. So like I said, 10 times, <laughs> you're most fertile for uh, 12 to 24 hours. So, and that's for everyone. Everyone's fertile for about 24 hours. It's typically uh, one day in your cycle, and it's between cycle days 11 to cycle day 17. Remember, cycle day one is the first day of your period when you're using a pad or a tampon. So, you know, you'll go through your period around day eight, day 10, depending on how long your cycle is, you'll start testing your OPK. Timing is unique to everyone. It's best to monitor your cycle for several months. So 99.9% .9 of people do not listen to me when I suggest this. So I highly recommend that you figure out your OPKs first. Make your OPKs easy if you can. If, if they're easy, then you know exactly when to inseminate. If you're inseminating on the wrong, the wrong day, it's no good. That frozen sperm is only gonna live for about 12 to 24 hours. Uh, again, we stick to the 24 hour rule, but that sperm's gonna live for 24 hours. You're only gonna be fertile for 24 hours. If you do it the day before, it's the wrong day. It's not gonna be alive the next day when you're fertile. So it's extremely important to get your OPKs right. Uh, so practice is important. I recommend testing two or three months before. Uh, unfortunately, OPKs don't work for everyone. I have a lot of patients, they just don't work. They try for two months and for some reason, it's just, it's light, it's dark, it's light, it's dark, and it, or it never gets dark and they don't know why. It's just not showing up on the OPKs. Can you get pregnant if your OPKs don't work for you? Absolutely. Can you get pregnant if the OPKs don't work and you want to do home insemination? Absolutely. You'll just need sonograms. There's quite a few things that we can do that are workarounds. They're more involved and it may be an indication that we want to test your fertility, but it, don't worry about it. If your OPKs don't work for you, then you're just one of those people. Contact your doctor, contact a reproductive endocrinologist, and they'll help you figure it out, okay? But if the OPKs every month you're getting the same dark, dark line, just like I showed you, you're great. Um, and, and you wanna make sure that you write down when you're actually having those LH surges. So uh, you'll, you'll find patterns. So you'll see, okay, I always get my LH surge or my positive OPK on cycle day 12. So I know that I should inseminate on cycle day 13. So when you get close to cycle day 12 and you've already got that sperm in your house and you're ready to defrost it, you'll be prepared and you'll know the pattern that your body takes. Uh, your medical provider can answer more questions about this. Uh, yeah, OBGYNs can definitely help with this. Next slide. Ready to inseminate. What do you need for a home insemination? A comfortable space where you feel safe, a needless syringe, which we will provide you, uh, the sperm sample, that's that vial. Instructions, there will be a packet that will talk you through how to uh, prepare the sperm. Uh, it's really simple, you just put it on the counter for 15 minutes. Uh, we recommend that you use some insulated gloves and eye protection because when you open the tank, there'll be a puff of smoke. That video that Morgan showed you a few slides back, that uh, goes through the whole unboxing, it goes through the puff of smoke and what you can uh, predict, but it's, it's a pretty easy procedure. Next slide. Prepare the space and yourself. So again, this is where couples find or individuals find in-home insemination more meaningful. It is 
a much less clinical environment. Do you need a sterile environment to do ICI, to do in-home insemination? Absolutely not. You do not need a sterile environment. This is not surgery. Uh, your home is clean and perfect as it is. Uh, you can put on some soothing music, candles, anything that helps you relax. Ideally, you'll be reclining on your back with your pelvis tilted for about two hours. Uh, place yourself in a positive frame of mind, focus on relaxation, meditate and breathe mindfully. So the key here, the one that I like the best out of all of these is breathe mindfully. Breathing mindfully will actually help relax your pelvic muscles, it'll help relax your body. When you're laying in that tilted position for two hours, uh, breathing mindfully will go a long way. Next slide. Intracervical insemination, or ICI, which we also call at-home insemination. So this is the nursing trick that I'm gonna give you. In nursing, we gather everything we need, lay it out in front of us, so there's no getting up to go get this, that, the other thing, all right? So you're gonna plan ahead, maybe make a list, and you'll get a nice clean space. You'll open the needleless syringe, leaving it in the wrapper. So the needleless syringe is actually sterile. We talked about um, this being a clean procedure. It does not need to be sterile but you get a sterile syringe anyway. And it will not have a needle attached to it. It'll come in this little container. So I would recommend taking out your syringe and touch it with your hands. Hopefully you washed your hands before. And the nursing trick that I have for syringes is that these plungers get stuck. So you wanna kind of play with it a little bit, make sure you get that motion, and then you can, um, you can use it very easily. I wouldn't put it in the sperm and then try to pull back because sometimes they get stuck. You just don't want it to pop. Uh, I hope that made sense. Uh, once you open it, you can put it back in the wrapper because your wrapper is sterile. Handling the sperm vial. Remove the tank lid. You'll see a puff of vapor. Wearing gloves, carefully remove the cane holding the vial. So you'll get this really industrial looking tank. When you open it up, there's this cane. You can see it's like it's a really light little metal cane and has all these spaces for vials. You'll probably just have one vial on here. Just pops on, pops off. It's this little guy. You can see this vial. So it's actually going to be a really tiny amount. Um, it's it's prepared, ready for ICI, and you only need a small amount. So you'll remove the vial from the cane, verify the donor number, it'll say donor 5525. So yep, that's him. Uh, wrap the vial in a cloth or paper towel to dry off any condensation. Leave it on the counter for 15, 20 minutes to allow the sample to thaw. Next slide. Uh, yeah. Uh, the person doing the insemination uh, yourself, which you can do it yourself, if you can put in a tampon, you can definitely do this. Uh, or your partner will wash their hands thoroughly and the person being inseminated will lay on their back with their hips elevated, knees bent. So you're gonna put a pillow under your butt and you're gonna bend your knees and you'll see that you are kind of tilted. So the reason we do that is that we want the sperm to sit back by the cervix the cervix is the entryway into the uterus where your eggs are waiting, your follicles are waiting. Uh, put a cushion under your buttocks, tilt the pelvis. Uh, you're gonna find your vial, and after 15, 20 minutes, you wanna check and see if it's defrosted. It's thawed, sorry, it's thawed. Uh, you're gonna carefully invert it. And that will let you know if it's liquid and if it's ready to be inserted. Uh, pick up and gently mix the sperm vial, allow the volume to settle to the bottom. Uh, again, no shaking, just invert it very carefully because these are living cells. Uh, open the syringe, pull the plunger up to break the seal and push it back to its original position. So when you played with the plunger earlier, you broke that seal. Uh, you're gonna stick it in here, pull back the plunger. It will grab all the sperm in here. And you'll see it'll probably be about, see my finger? It'll be about that much, okay? That clear part right there. So it's a small amount, it's absolutely fine. Next slide. 
You or your partner will carefully open the sperm vial by unscrewing the cap, slowly and carefully drop the sample as we did into the needleless syringe, place the syringe into the vagina as far as it will go with the tip close to but not touching the cervix. So what you're gonna do, you're gonna lay on your back, you or your partner are going to insert it just like you would a tampon. And when you hit something, you've hit your cervix. If you don't hit anything and the syringe is all the way in, it's absolutely fine, okay? Um, if you hit something, you pull back maybe an inch and then you deposit. What you hit is your cervix. So you pull back a little bit, deposit, push down the plunger, and the sperm will swim inside the cervix and into the uterus. Uh, so here we have a diagram. It shows the vaginal canal. That is the cervix, that little rounded pink thing with the hole in it. That's where the sperm swim into. And then at the very top, we have the uterus, the uterine cavity. Uh, they will swim through the uterine cavity into the fallopian tubes, and the follicles are waiting there for the sperm. Uh, so place the syringe into the vagina as far as it will go. Oh. Just really quickly, I know that they sell very expensive syringes online. Absolutely do not need the expensive syringe. These have worked for all time <laughs> and they're absolutely fine. So you don't need a rounded tip. If you need to get out the last of the sperm and it's kind of stuck in that tip, pull the plunger back. You can put air into your vagina, it's okay. And you can put just a tiny bit. So you pull it back, maybe till it says 0.1 and then push that in. If there's still more left in there, Pull it back twice as far. Push that in. It's absolutely fine. You're not putting it into the cervix. You're just putting it into the vaginal canal. And if a little bit of air gets in there, absolutely fine. So there's no reason to waste sperm. And there's no reason to buy a very expensive syringe. If you look and you go, oh, no, I have more left in here, just pull it up. And then make sure you get that in with a little bit of air. It's fine, OK? I would not recommend putting a whole syringe of air. That would just be kind of awkward. Um, might not feel comfortable, but just a little bit. Push that in, get that extra sperm in. Uh, remove the syringe and relax. Remain lying comfortably for about 30 minutes, but up to two hours. So shift your position from abdomen to your back every 20 minutes. So I like this because you're laying down for two hours, but if you're laying on your stomach, and you flip over to your back, what happens is the sperm washes over the, cer the cervix every single time. And you can see there's a tiny little hole in that cervix. That's where the sperm swims into. So every time you flip over, that sperm can swim into the cervix. So uh, I would recommend shifting your position, plus laying on your back with your, with your pelvis tilted for two hours might be uncomfortable. Next slide. Post-intracervical insemination. Oh, okay. So if you look at this picture, we just got a picture of the vaginal canal with a menstrual cup in it. So a menstrual cup, a diaphragm, a soft cup, they're all rounded like this. Uh, there's a lot of individuals who like to use these. Either they put the sperm directly in the cup or they put the sperm up against the cervix and then put the cup in. Uh, the thought is that it will encourage the sperm to go into the cervix. These little cups, they sort of, I don't know how, but they kind of gravitate towards the cervix and they suction onto the cervix. So that way the sperm only has a limited space in which to swim. So it can either go in the cervix or it can try to get down to the tip of the menstrual cup. Either way, it's, it's, uh, it's something that a lot of people like to do. If you're looking for uh, a soft cup, they can be a little more gentle uh, you can get them on, I think Amazon has them, just Google soft cup. Um, it's not necessary, but some do like it. You're going to continue to remain uh, reclined. That allows the sperm to swim through the cervix and into the uterus up to the egg. Some individuals choose to do multiple inseminations during the fertile window. So we talked about your fertile window being technically textbook wise, 12 to 24 hours. Most people are 24 hours. Um, but if you're curious on whether or not you might be more on the 12 hour cycle, then you can do two inseminations. Uh, but speak to your medical provider about this. Next slide. ICI considerations. Uh, so nothing in the vagina before or after the ICI. <clears throat> I would not put any lubricant or anything in the vagina. Um, 
there are a lot of products out there that tell you that you should clean inside your vagina, that you should put lubricant inside your vagina and that will help the sperm swim. That is not true. That is absolutely not true. You create your own cervical mucus, you have your own discharge that's in there that while you're ovulating is so absolutely perfect for the sperm to swim into the uterus. I would not mess with that in any way. There's these little highways, these little channels that encourage the sperm to swim up into the uterus, through the cervix, up into the uterus. But if you're putting oil-based or water-based lubricant in there, then you're messing with what your body can naturally do, the magic that your body can naturally do. So I would highly recommend that you do not use any sort of lubricant or goop or anything, do not put that in there. I would never, ever recommend putting soap, water, or douche in the vagina. Um, if you absolutely have to, I know a lot of patients are like, well, that's what I do, I rinse it out all the time. Um, just don't do it for at least 48 hours, 24 hours before your ICI and then uh, you have to think you've got that 24-hour fertile period. You absolutely don't want to put anything in the vagina um, within that 24 hours. The sperm is very fragile, and you don't want to kill it. Uh, so I would recommend not swimming, don't take baths, don't sit in a hot tub for up to 24 hours. The sperm's going to live for 24 hours. You're fertile for 24 hours. Just avoid that. Uh, you can take showers. That's fine. Um, I would not put anything in sex-wise. Uh, anything penetrative in, I don't think that that's a good idea. We don't want to mess with the sperm. It's a very small amount and we want to keep it up by the cervix. Uh, female orgasm. Okay, so there. this is always the question that I get from patients. Should I have an orgasm? Does that help me get pregnant? So this is a theory. It is not evidence-based. Unfortunately, there just have not been enough studies to determine whether female orgasm can help you get pregnant. The idea is that the contractions that are happening can actually help pull the sperm into the uterus and encourage the sperm to go up to the follicles that are waiting in your fallopian tubes. Um, I encourage patients to do it because there are some theories that just make sense to me. You're gonna have an increase in estrogen with a female orgasm. You're gonna have an increase in those magical cervical fluids with the highway, those channels that encourage the sperm to go upwards. So why not do it? Uh, it's an increase in pleasure hormones and it's gonna help you de-stress. I, I would encourage you to do that with uh, clitoral stimulation. Again, I wouldn't go for penetration. I really wouldn't put anything in the vagina if you can help it. Um, yeah, next slide. What is the cost of home insemination? Okay, so you're going to buy your donor sperm. Donor sperm we know uh, is roughly $1,100 for a vial. You'll also pay for shipping and handling. We have to ship it in a super fancy tank uh, and it usually needs to be overnight. Uh, Fairfax Cryobank will provide written instructions for thawing the sperm sample and for the ICI along with a needleless syringe. So we talked about our syringe and we talked about thawing literally just leaving it on the counter for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, a lot of other banks will request that you do a, uh, a warm bath where you have to have a warm bath that stays at a certain temperature and you're, it's just there's a lot of complicated options for thawing sperm but for ours you just leave it on the counter for 15 minutes. I love it. So easy. Okay uh, next next slide. Success rates. If you have no fertility issues or health concerns, it's up to 10% success rate per cycle. Uh, if it can take several insemination attempts to achieve pregnancy, please, please, please be cautiously optimistic. Uh, and please know that this process for most individuals, for most couples can be very emotional. Um, getting that first negative uh, pregnancy test can be can be hard, but know in your mind that you're probably going to have to do several cycles. You're going to have to do several months to get pregnant. If you're not pregnant after several home attempts, it is best to speak with your medical provider about having a fertility assessment. You may also want to meet with a reproductive endocrinologist to talk about other options, other ways to increase your success rates with something like intrauterine insemination or even IVF. Um, what else do I want to say? Yeah, 
that's it. Next slide. Q&A. Morgan? Wonderful. Thank you, Kate. Yeah. All right. So as you can see here, we do have um, an exclusive saving for those who are on the webinar today to enter uh, this promo code here, which is Home in STEM Webinar 2022. It's a mouthful, but yeah, make sure you get that whole promo code in there, all one word in uppercase. And that will get you the free full unlimited access that we reviewed at the beginning of the presentation, which is $149 value. That gets you uh, all, as much as you can view on the profiles, unlimited uh, downloading and access to any uh, available lifetime and adult photos. So that's a great deal. And that will really help you all on your journey to find your donor. So now go ahead and submit your questions in the webinar panel here, and we will start to go through them. One moment. Uh, is there a promo or discount on the sperm today for watching this webinar? So yes, as you just saw, we have that uh, free full access. Use that promo code there. Um, as you can see, the promo code is only valid through the end of the month. Um, okay. If you use one IUI vial and two IUI art vials to try inseminating at 12 hours and then at 24 hours, would it matter if you inseminate with IUI vial or two IUI art vials first? I absolutely don't understand the question. Can you repeat it? <laughs> yes, if this person um, wants to clarify their question, they can do that too. You can submit or follow up. All right, let me repeat this question. If you okay. use one IUI vial and two IUI art vials to try inseminating at 12 hours and then 24 hours, would it okay. matter if you inseminate with IUI or two IUI art vials first? Okay, so if you're doing home insemination, you want to use ICI vials. Uh, ICI vials are, uh, from what I understand, the IUI, it, it's a little stickier and it's missing the seminal fluid. So stick with ICI vials. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are doing two ICI art at the 12 or one ICI at the 24. It doesn't matter if you flip them. I understand your question. I just hope I'm explaining it so it's clear. So yeah, it doesn't matter if you, if you have one ICI and then two ICI art. I should explain that ICI art is a half of a vial. So this person clearly found a donor that they like and purchased what they could, which was one ICI and then two ICI art to equal a whole vial. It doesn't matter which one you use first or which one you use second. So good question. My doctor said I could purchase IUI for a home insemination. Should I switch them to ICI? Yes, switch to ICI. Uh, I think that's a that's a better option. How long are vials viable if purchasing multiple for other uses? How long? Oh, okay. So uh, we used to say that frozen sperm lasted 10 years. We now know that that is absolutely not true. We took the sperm out at 10 years and tested it, took it out at 15, tested it. It's absolutely the same. So as of right now, we say that the frozen vials last indefinitely. We're not seeing any changes in the quality of the sperm. We're not seeing any detrimental effects to the babies. So what we believe right now is that you could buy a vial today and technically it would be good in 50 years. So there, there is, so you can buy what you want today. It will be fine when you're ready to use it. Do you recommend a double insemination each month? Yeah, that's, that's tricky. <clears throat> so the textbooks say 12 to 24 hours. Uh, that once you get your LH surge, once you get your positive OPK, you've got 12 to 24 hours to inseminate. Uh, because in 12 or 24 hours, 12 to 24 hours, you'll be ovulating. I, I, for the average person, I would just stick to the 24 hour rule. I think that it's a lot easier. Um, I think it's unlikely that most people are ovulating earlier. As we get older, sometimes we ovulate a little bit earlier. Um, but if we're older, then probably we shouldn't, like meaning over the age of 35, I don't think that, yeah. I think under the age of 35, you don't have to. Uh, it may increase your chances, but you don't have to. It's kind of up to you. You can also talk to your doc about it, but 
yeah, the t the 24 hour rule is it's your best to stick by. Yeah, so once you get your positive OPK in 24 hours, assume that you are in fact ovulating and that you are fertile. Um, and then could you only test for the surge once a day? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I think when people start testing throughout the day, things get really complicated. I think there's a lot of other factors, um, hydration, stress, uh, that that affect your LH. And all you want is that bonkers high LH surge. You want the one that goes off the graph. You don't want to see that little increase. So if you're buying the $150 ovulation predictor kit, kit tests, um, they're going to tell you to test every couple hours. People are exhausted. They are stressed out from testing, from trying to pee every couple hours to test their, it just, it just doesn't make sense. It's likely that if you're going to have an LH surge, it's gonna be overnight, maybe 2, 3 a.m. for most people. Um, so when you wake up first thing, finding out that surge, I think it's, I think it's a good idea. Um, there is such a thing as stressing yourself out, and that's gonna make it hard to get pregnant too if you're out of your mind just constantly peeing on a stick to figure out when you're, um, when you're getting your LH surge. And again, like I said, you want that bonkers high number. You don't wanna watch it get slowly up there. So I would just test in the morning. And if you're always getting up two hours before your alarm, that's fine. If your alarm changes on Tuesdays, you work at 10, so you sleep an extra hour, that's fine too. Just stick to the two and a half hours before you wake up, pee, then wake up, pee again, test that. Can you share success stats between IUI at clinic versus home and SEM? Yeah, so sh I'm gonna give the short answer. So the short answer is ICI, in-home insemination, is a five to 10% chance of getting pregnant. IUI, uh, which is in the clinic, we go through the cervix for you. We deposit sperm directly into the uterus. It's called intrauterine insemination. That is about a 20% chance of getting pregnant. Now, with age, uh, starting at age 31, your fertility decreases and your chances of getting pregnant decreases. If you have something like a comorbidity, like diabetes or high blood pressure, that's also going to decrease your chances of getting pregnant. So there's, the numbers that I give you are the healthy people in the middle, but a lot of people are outliers. So um, maybe even uh, obes obesity is also another cause of infertility. Um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So there's a lot of things that happen that can cause a decrease in fertility. So the number I gave you are um, people of reproductive age, um, I'd say between 20 and 35 years old and without any health conditions, okay? Um, can you have sex with your bail partner before the ICI? At what point leading up to ICI should you not have sex? Yeah, I I would recommend that there's no nothing official on this, but I would recommend not having sex 24 hours before the ICI. Your male partner is going to bring his own biome. He's going to bring his own bacteria, um, and it's not something that's necessarily friendly for the sperm. So I would recommend just kind of keeping everything as it is. Just avoid sex 24 hours before you have an insemination and an ICI. I also, I, I know there's a lot of people out there, a lot of doctors out there that recommend sex right after ICI. I, I don't think it's a good idea. You have such a small sample of sperm that that kind of movement would take it out of the vagina. It just doesn't make sense. You would lower your sperm count and you would potentially damage some of that sperm. So I would say 24 hours before and after I would not have sex. Um, we did talk about uh, female orgasm though and clitoral stimulation, not penetration, clitoral stimulation is thought theory-wise, no evidence, theory-wise to be good for getting pregnant. It can encourage pregnancy, but we don't have any proof. Um, and uh, following up on that, someone wanted to know, is that for the female? Is that before or after the home and sem? After. So there was this guy that did some studies. <laughs> he did like two of them. And, um, he found that the study only did something like, they tested like 45 minutes afterwards. So 
Some of the theories say 45 minutes afterwards. Some of them say three hours afterwards. I don't think it matters, guys. You're, too, you're fertile for 24 hours. I don't see why it, why it would matter um, at all. But yeah, within that 24 hour period that you're fertile, within the 24 hour period that that frozen, thawed, frozen sperm is going to live, I would say the orgasm makes sense. Um, here's another question, Kate. I've been told my cervix is tilted toward the back. Should I still rotate my position every 20 minutes after inseminating? <clears throat> yeah, so I'm not going to get on my high, high horse, but everyone's cervix is tilted. <laughs> Everyone has an angle to their cervix. That's what makes cervixes beautiful. Uh, they all tilt different directions. So the way that you're going to make sure that that sperm gets into the cervix is you're going to keep flipping every two hours and you're going to keep that pelvis tilted so when you're when you're tilted it encourages just gravity wise to keep that sperm at your cervix and then when you flip over it will flush your cervix even if your cervix is tilted to the left or the right or up or down it will get there if you're really really concerned about it and you want to try the soft cup not a bad idea because it will encourage it to stay up in there um, and then I would continue to do that that flip even with the soft cup and uh, make sure you read the instructions on the soft cup some of them can stay in longer than others but again you're fertile for 24 hours so that would be your aim um, we're getting a couple questions like this other one here um, is an IUI prep less optimal for cervical insemination because the sperm are less protected anything that I should do differently when inseminating if only an IUI prep is available? So this person wants to do ICI with an IUI vial? Yes. Because they feel it's more protective? No, they said that you mentioned that their um, IUI is more sticky. Yes. It's thought to be less viscous and uh, we want that sperm to swim. If you get the ICI, there will be more seminal fluid plus your cervical fluid, and that'll help it swim. Um, um, and what happens if the IUI is the only option available? Oh, then I would do IUI. I wouldn't do ICI with it. If you love, love, love your donor and all they have is IUI, I would look into doing IUI. That's my recommendation. Um, okay, here's another question. How long should you wait after getting your IUD out to do ICI? Oh, okay, good question. I had a patient once who took out her IUD and she had sex that night, got pregnant that night. So once you take out your IUD, um, you can get pregnant right, right away. Uh, if you have a hormonal IUD, I would wait uh, maybe till the next cycle to get pregnant. If you have a copper IUD and there's no hormones in your body, uh, you can start right away. Uh, so yeah, wait till, wait till the next cycle. Um, if you're, if you had a, have an IUD and you're not getting periods, wait until your period comes back and it regulates. I'm trying to think of any other exceptions. Um, definitely track your periods. Some people don't have periods with IUDs. So yeah, wait till, wait till your period comes back. Uh, wait till it feels regulated and then start. Regulated meaning that you're getting your period on uh, on some sort of pattern. So every 28, every 30 days. Okay, but you're technically fertile right away. Um, okay, great. When I've attempted this so far, it seems like the semen comes right back, right out, along with the syringe. Is there a way to avoid that? Yes. The way to avoid it would be to tilt your pelvis. So, when we give injections, I always tell my patients that if you if you had a needle and you were giving an injection, you push, you wait three seconds, I make them count three crocodiles, one crocodile, two crocodile, three crocodile, and then pull it out. If you notice that it's coming back out with it, it could be kind of sticky in there, you might want to, so you should have about a half an ml. If you wanna add another, 0.2 of just air to get that extra bit from the tip, that could help. So if it's sticky and all kind of stuck together and there's some still left in the syringe, that could be pulling it out. So add just a little bit of extra air and try to push that in. Um, 
you can also try to sort of wipe it off, get it off the syringe. It is needleless, so it shouldn't hurt to do that. Um, that's the only thing I can think of. Um, another question here, how many home inseminations and IUIs should you do before moving to IVF? Should the inseminations be consecutive or does it not matter? Yeah, so I get that question a lot. So if you're doing ICI at home, then you're probably not using medication. Um, <clears throat> I think that you can do them whenever you wanna do them. I don't think that they need to be consecutive. I don't know any reason why they would need to be consecutive. If you are doing something like intrauterine insemination or IVF with medication, that medication revs up your ovaries and it's good to do consecutive cycles. Uh, so I, I would not, for ICI, I think you can be pretty casual about it. Um, I'm sorry, what was the other question? Oh, how long to wait to switch over? Yep. It's different for everyone. Um, oh gosh, I wouldn't, I mean, three to six is a good number, but it's entirely up to you. We have patients that do, you know, in-home inseminations. They do, they're going to do as many as they want. They can do 12 if they want. Um, but it's up to you, it's up to your financial situation, and also how you're handling it emotionally. I know that this, this can be a very emotional process. Um, uh, meeting with a reproductive endocrinologist is a good idea to get a sense of what's out there, what your next steps would be. A lot of places will do free consults, so you can go in and say, look, this is who I am, this is, you know, what's happening in my body, this is what's, this is what I'm trying, what would be my next steps, what do you recommend, doctor? And then you can take it in, make your decision. Um, uh, another question here, any recommended ovulation testers? Yes, not the digital. <laughs> Don't get the digital. Don't get the super expensive ones. Don't get the ones that say that they're super, super sensitive. They can tell you days ahead of time. That's for couples using fresh sperm. We're using frozen sperm. So I recommend that patients get the cheaper ones, maybe even the store brand. Uh, I've had patients get CVS, Walmart brand. Uh, they're absolutely fine. And you wanna make sure you get the one that looks like a litmus test that has the two lines, just like an old school pregnancy test. And in fact, it, it's in a little device that looks like an old school pregnancy test. So yeah, but brand, yeah, store brand is fine. Um, why can't you insert the ICI directly into the cervix? Oh, okay. So, it's <clears throat> a big question. So, when I do intrauterine inseminations, I go through the cervix. I need, um, I need a special, I don't have one here in my office right now, but uh, it would be a syringe like this and it would have a long, thin, thin straw on the end. To get into the cervix is, a bit of an ordeal and it's something that only a medical professional can do or should do. Uh, it may cause bleeding, sometimes you have to kind of finagle your way in and you want to do it at the precise time, you don't want to do it any time during the cycle. So that's something that your medical professional should do and I would not attempt putting anything through the cervix. Great, um, okay, I think we just have a few more questions here. Um, if I am overweight and want to lose weight for better chances of pregnancy and a healthier pregnancy and baby, is there a particular goal I should aim for? Talk to your doctor. Uh, so with weight gain can come irregular periods. Uh, weight gain can also be seen with patients who are polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, patients who have thyroid issues. Uh, sometimes it can lead to metabolic syndromes like diabetes and hypertension. So make sure that what's happening is, is just that you have a little extra weight on you and that maybe you need to eat better. So make sure that there isn't any other process happening in the body. Um, that will help limit complications for you and your baby during pregnancy. You want to have the healthiest baby you can and you want to have the healthiest pregnancy you can. So make sure you talk to your doctor first. Um, <clears throat> and there's a I know a lot of people don't like the BMI, the body mass index calculator, but you can go online. There are calculators that will help you, or even graphs that will help you determine what your weight should be. So for your height, um, your weight should be X amount and it'll give you a range. So um, it, it's good to do that. If you are finding that you're falling into the morbidly obese section, so um, 
there's there's different degrees of obesity. If you feel like you're maybe 50 to 100 pounds overweight, I would highly recommend talking to a doctor about how to lose weight and how to do so safely. Uh, it's important not to do things like crash diets and never do crash diets or diet pills, especially when you're trying to get pregnant. So dieting and putting your body into a state of stress and then trying to get pregnant, they don't, they don't fit. Um, if you want to start to eat healthier while you're doing ICI, that's good. Um, but you said it perfectly. I would recommend losing a little bit of weight. That can increase your fertility and your chances of getting pregnant. Um, so talk to your doc. Let them know what, what's going on. And uh, when you do your preconception visit and they draw all that blood, they'll also say, okay, well, you've got a little bit of extra weight. Let's make sure your sugars are good. Let's make sure your thyroid is good. Okay. And I do want to plug that Kate has done an amazing uh, Getting Healthy uh, Before Your Pregnancy webinar and blog post with us. So check out that content on our YouTube page and on our Fairfax Cryobank blog if you're interested in learning more. Kate did a great job on and putting all those details in there. Um, okay, so just a few more questions. One question, Kate, um, to confirm if you folks need to request a syringe from client services when they're processing their home and SEM order? I, think, I believe you, yes. Can you repeat that? I, I didn't hear it. Folks need to request a syringe from client services when um, placing this order? Oh gosh. Um, I believe so I it is. I thought it just came with it, but <laughs> I, I don't I would know. Let, I would let the rep know when you're placing your order for home insemination, when you're talking to client services, if you want a syringe to come with it, you do need to notify them. Give okay. them a heads up. Um, can I also just say, I had a patient who uh, didn't have a syringe one night and they were ready to do their insemination and they panicked. They didn't know what to do. <clears throat> so, um not to be too long-winded, but the average length of the vaginal canal is about 10 centimeters. It's this, I'll hold it up to my face so you can see the reference, it's about 10 centimeters. Our vial is about four centimeters. You could, if you can get your fingers, right? It's just like putting in a tampon, putting in one of those OBs without the applicators. Um, if you can kind of put that in and you're, you have your pelvis tilted up, it's going to come out, it's going to drip out it will find its way to the cervix. So if you end up, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Uh, a syringe is much more precise and it's going to make sure that it, all of it gets up to, to the cervix. Um, but if you were ever in a pinch and you didn't have a syringe, you, you could just put it in. Um, again, that's not your best option, but it, it is a possibility. Great. Um, and then I think we have one last question. There, there are so many great questions on here um, for folks who didn't get an answer to their question today. Um, you know, contact client services at info at fairfaxcryobank.com or global at fairfaxcryobank.com. If you're abroad uh, in Canada or the UK, they can confirm um, if we're able to ship to your specific location, your state or your international address for home and STEM. So they will really be the best bet for uh, getting answers to these questions that we didn't have time for today. Um, okay, so one last question. Um, one second here, sorry. If I'm 36 with no fertility issues, should I stick to the 24 hour rule or back down some maybe to 18? Okay, so, um, <clears throat> I think over the age of 35, and this is my medical opinion, I think over the age of 35, um, your chances of getting pregnant with ICI are, are pretty reduced. You're looking more at the 5% or less with ICI. Um, I think your best bet is to work with a reproductive endocrinologist. And I think uh, intrauterine insemination or IVF may be better for you because there's a higher likelihood of getting pregnant. Uh, I know financially that can sound very daunting. There are loan programs for fertility needs. So if you're going to a reproductive endocrinologist, they will very likely be able to refer you to a loan company that can help you take out a loan, get your IVF while you're young and 36, 
uh, and then you'll pay it off slowly over time. Um, any, anybody over the age of 35, your fertility starts to decrease quite rapidly, and um, I, I would not go with ICI. I would, I would go for the big guns. You know, you're gonna probably save money in the long run. Um, and Fairfax has vials for IUI and IVF. Wonderful. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Kate. Um, and we hope to see you on the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining.